uh, open your scripture, if you have it with you this morning, uh, to John chapter 8. You can use the Bible on the rack. We're on page 894. Uh, the scripture that we're going to be in, and as well as all the notes and uh, a few bonus items as well, are in the U Version Bible app under the events section. Uh, I don't know if you pay attention to the news very often. I try not to, um, as I confessed a lot last week about uh, how how some of that drives my mood. Uh, but there's been an issue with a pastor that's been going on in the on the world stage. Uh, his name is Andrew Brunson. He's from North Carolina. But he's been, he planted and started and been pastoring a church in the country of Turkey for 25 years. Two years ago, in October 2016, he was arrested. They came and arrested him, and he's been rotting in a Turkish prison for two years. Uh, they put him under house arrest, moved him from prison to house arrest a few weeks ago. And in the, uh, he's undergone three separate hearings, and in each one of the hearings, they still find him guilty and move on. Uh, and he tries to appeal that, and it goes to another hearing. He's got one more hearing coming up this next October. But in the last hearing, it was very unique, his situation, undergoing what he's going through, being away from his family, uh, being away from the people he's been ministering to for so long. He's accused of Christianization, which is classified in Turkey as terrorism. Telling people about Jesus in Turkey is terrorism. Uh, He's accused of several other things, but it all ties back to Christianization. And uh, he's been in jail for that now for two years. He faces up to 35 years in prison, which for him, at this point, would be the rest of his life. But then he, he takes the stand with all of this weighing on him a few weeks ago in his third hearing. And he's sitting there on the stand, and he's being berated by the prosecution I don't know if you've ever been on the witness stand in a Turkish courtroom, uh, but it's not quite like law and order in America at all. Uh, And so he's being berated by this this Turkish um, prosecutor about a lot of different things. And uh, he finally gets a chance to speak. And when he speaks, uh, he, he says that he considers himself truly blessed to be considered worthy to suffer on behalf of Jesus. And then he openly forgives everybody who has persecuted him. The people in jail who've beat him, the guards, the people who came and arrested him, the judge, the prosecutor, the president of Turkey, the entire Turkish court system. He forgives everybody. And then he shares the gospel. He shares the love of Jesus, Jesus' death and resurrection right there in open court. It's on the Turkish record that may be stricken by now, but at the time it was on the record. He shares the gospel with everyone in the room because for him what matters more is that everyone would know Jesus. He, it, he doesn't necessarily want revenge on the, pe- on, the, on the guards who would beat him. He wants them to know Jesus. That's what he cares about. He's keeping his eyes on the prize, on the main thing. He cares more about their eternity than his temporary discomfort. And I I, I was reading this and just flabbergasted at this guy. You know, a lot of times we get frustrated with somebody who posts something on social media or or who takes the last box of cereal that we like at Walmart. I hope their cart breaks. And we get really irritated at these people. And, and, And we don't even think about their heart, you know. And here this guy is actually being beaten and, and uh, suffering and potentially may die in a Turkish prison, and he's asking Jesus to redeem the very ones doing the beating. In truth, there is no exemption from a need for redemption. Everybody needs redemption. Everybody. Even the guy who took the last box of your favorite cereal, and you got to settle for the non-honey nut version. You know, even though that guy took the last box, even, you know, the person who posts that thing, even these people who were beaten, Pastor Andrew, there's no exemption from a need for redemption. Everybody needs it. Everybody needs it. What what redemption means, it means to buy back. It means to pay for, spiritually, to have somebody's sins paid for. Everybody needs their sins paid for. Everybody needs grace. Everybody needs mercy. Even those we might find difficult to like. They, may, they need redemption just as much as I do. 
And their likability doesn't determine their redemption. Thank goodness. <laughs> and I'm speaking that for myself. In John chapter 8, we come across a, a scene in the ministry of Jesus where he cares very much for the people he's talking to, uh, passionately, even though at times their discussion gets uh, quite heated on the other end. He still cares for them. He still wants them to be redeemed. He wants them to come to know the Lord. Uh, but we're going to read this conversation. And as we read this conversation, I want you to try to put yourself in the mind of Jesus in the moment as he's explaining things to them, but also try to hear in his words the love he has for these people. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 8. We're going to start down in verse 25. So they said to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. Now start, just, he's, they, they ask the question, who are you? They're hearing truths from, them, from him, and they're trying to gather all this info, and they're saying, who are you? They don't quite understand who he is. It doesn't uh, um, uh, process within them who this could possibly be, because he's speaking great truth, and they don't understand how someone who comes from where he comes from, who looks the way he looks, uh, who smells the way he smells, and, and who acts the way he acts, could speak with such authority and power. They say, who are you? And Jesus says to them, I, just what I've been telling you from the beginning. He says, I've never hid who I am. I've told you over and over again. And we know that from his own teaching that he has told them repeatedly that he is the Son of God, that he is the Messiah, that he will die but then raise. He tells them, but they still don't quite get it. They still don't understand. Verse 27, they did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus is talking to them, and he says, uh, I've been telling you this the whole time, and they still don't get it, what's going on. I don't know if you've ever had that conversation. If you have children, you know what I'm talking about, where you have the conversation over and over and over again. You still don't process it. Um, and I've been that way, uh, you know, not understood what something has said, maybe from my wife. She said something to me, and I, I didn't get it, and it didn't process, or I, it sends me to Walmart, and I bring home five things, and none of them were the thing I was supposed to go to Walmart to get, because I didn't understand. I didn't, or maybe it's my attention span. I don't know. But anyway, these people don't understand what he's saying. Verse 28, so Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. He says, you don't understand now, but you will know. He says in verse 28, there will come a time when you will understand, when it will sink in. He says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man. Now, there's two things there. Lifted up was a way they said back then, crucified, being lifted up on the cross, when the Son of Man has been lifted up. So any person in a Roman culture in that particular area would understand he's talking about being crucified. But then that phrase, the Son of Man, that is an Old Testament title for the Messiah, for the Son of God. It comes from several Old Testament prophecies, the Son of Man. So when he says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, he, anyone in that culture would understand. He's saying, when, when you people have crucified the Messiah, you will know that I am he. So these are very big declarations Jesus is making right there. Huge, huge. He's saying, I am the Messiah. He's saying, you people will crucify me. He says, I do nothing of my own authority but speak as the Father taught me. You don't know now. You will know then. The Father led me here. I followed where the Father wanted me to go. I will be crucified. He's really passionate about them understanding, even though they don't get it where they are now. He says understanding will come down the road. Now, when we think about all of us and we, th we think about spiritual things or we think about where our lives are going, or where our lives will lead to, where we will be in five years, where we will be in 10 years. What's God's plan for my life? I, I may not understand all of it, you know, and in truth, 
You know, God may set me on a direction and I don't quite have the full picture of the direction. And, and, and before I take the first step to go the way God wants me to go, I really want him to, 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 to paint a clearer picture of what the end result will be because I don't want to take a first step if it's not going to be like I want it to be. But God's not going to paint a clear picture of the end until we get there. We can only take the next step that he has revealed to us. And once we take that step, he will reveal the next step and the step after that. And then once we get to the end of where he has led us, only then can we look back and see the picture he showed us at the time and realize how powerful it is. But when he starts to reveal that path and the direction and his plan for our lives, and as he says there, you will understand. You don't now. You don't get it now. Then that understanding may not come till heaven, but you will understand later. Maybe not now. What he's saying is it's not about your understanding right now. It's not even about where you came from and the understanding you had yesterday. Because any of these people, God can use in a phenomenal way. We've seen from Scripture, God used some terrible, terrible people to do some great, great things. We know from Paul, Paul himself was a murderer. Paul himself did some detestable things, and yet God used him to do some phenomenal things. David, you know, David, the adulterer, David, the, the murderer, David who conspired and, and, and led other people to sin to cover up his own sin, God still called him a man after his own heart. God can use people with a past to do great things because God cares about where we are going more than where we have come from. It's not about where we're coming from. It's about where we're going, where we came from. The enemy wants to remind you of the bad things you did in the past. The enemy wants to shame you about how little you understood about where God had you in the past. Not God. God wants to point you to the future and where he wants you to go and what he wants to accomplish through you in the days to come. And so Jesus says to this crowd, he says, you will understand. You will get it. You don't now your ancestors didn't understand. They completely blew it and did not understand that the, the promise of the Messiah was coming. They didn't get it, but you guys will understand, even in the midst of doing something that you may regret one day. You, the realization will come, oh, we are crucifying the Son of God. He says, you will understand. Jesus cares more about where you're going than where you have been and where you have come from. Jesus, though, was very patient with them in the moment. I think about that in explaining things to my children sometimes. Jesus was patient with them. They didn't understand, even though they should. Every one of them, you know, who was raised in a particular culture, a Jewish culture, would have understood the prophecies about the coming Messiah. They would have known the truth. They would have known what Scripture said. So they should have understood the words that he's talking about. But they didn't understand it, even though they should. And that is true of all of us. There's a lot of things we should understand that we should get a hold of, but we don't. You know, we've been believers for X number of years. There's some things we should get, but we don't. We're X number of years old. There's things that we should be able to process by now, but we don't quite yet. We should know. We should understand. These guys should get it, but they don't. And Jesus is still patient with them because he's concerned about their future. He's concerned about where they are going. He doesn't issue forth in great impatience because impatience is selfish. Impatience is selfish. It's all about me. Get there faster. Let's do this quicker. Let's, let's go to where we need to go and get there as fast as we possibly can because I don't want to wait on God. And even though impatience will ultimately lead to sin and mistakes and errors, impatience is selfish. And Jesus doesn't display impatience here at all. He's extremely patient with this crew. You will understand. Jesus keeps talking in verse 29. He who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Now that statement, though, at the very end of verse 29, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. That flabbergasts me. Because if I try to put myself in that position, I know I can't say that at all. I, what about you? Can you say that? I always do the things that please God. Nope. I mean, right now, it is 10.10 10 a.m. 
I guarantee you I've done at least 10 things this morning that were unpleasing to God, that were displeasing, excuse me, to God. But Jesus says, I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Well, you, you may say, well, he's God. I mean, he's Jesus. He, he, of course, he always does. But we see throughout the life of Jesus, Jesus is invested with his time with the Lord. He takes specific and strategic time to spend that time with God. And, and spending that time with God allows him to digest the words that God puts in him, and he goes out and he does it. Not that Jesus doesn't fully understand the heart of God because he is God. He is fully divine. But at the same time, he still goes and gets to know the heart of God better even in that. And that is hard to really comprehend and wrap our head around, but whatever. That is what Scripture talks about. That's the way it is. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe it. So Jesus goes and, and he invests his time with the Lord and he says, as a result of that, verse 29, he has not left me. I always do the things that are pleasing to him. He has invested that time with the Lord, and it has resulted in a digestion, in an application of what the Lord wants him to do. But the, the problem for us becomes, a lot of times when we hear a word from the Lord, we don't necessarily digest it, we simply ingest it. We take it in, but we don't apply it. It doesn't sink in. It doesn't transform into energy in our lives as the food we take in should. And if you have a child, you understand this. If you've ever had a baby, they can ingest things all day, but they don't necessarily digest it. The other day, we were eating dinner, and it, you, know, you never know what food a child will like. One day, it's the best thing in the world. The next day, they don't eat it at all. Uh, but we were eating, I can't even remember what it was, but it was great. And it, uh, Katie made it. It had a lot, you know, uh, some kind of, it was chicken, and it had a lot, uh, cheese, and, and I, I don't even remember. But uh, Hope wasn't touching any of it. Any, I mean, even the rolls, I mean, she ate a few bite of rolls, but that means she would put it in her mouth and it would come out and then there's soggy chicken and rolls on her plate, uh, on her tray there. And she was ingesting and then just letting it fall out. And she was taking it in, but it wasn't being digested by her body and being transformed out into, you know, energy for her body to use. She wasn't digesting it. And we do that all the time with scripture. We ingest it, but we don't digest it. I'm not saying, when I say we, I'm saying me mainly here. You know, it's easy to, to if, if we're good and we read scripture that morning, we read it. Oh, man, that's a great verse. We may underlight it. We may highlight it. You know, we may even journal that day. I mean, that would be an amazing day. We, journal, we write that verse, and the second we get up to go get our second cup of coffee, that thing's out of our head. We've ingested it, but we didn't digest it. We didn't process it. It didn't transform into spiritual energy in our lives because we simply took it in and allowed it to spill out and not process within us. So we can't say, he has not left me alone. I always do the things that are pleasing to him because we haven't invested the time. More time invested means more digested, not merely ingested. If you invest the time, there will be digestion not just ingestion, but it comes from investment. It comes from spending the time. Because if we see with these people, Jesus cares about their future. He cares about where they're going. But he wants them to, to invest the time with the Lord in order to get to where God wants them to be and experience the best life he has for them possible. But they've got to invest the time. Look at verse 31. Powerful statement here. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed. Now, understand, remember, he just said, he said what he said, and it said many believed in him. And now here it says, he says to those who believe. So he's speaking to the believers, the ones who are beginning their process of belief. Now, think about that as we continue to read the rest of this. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Disciples. And that word abide is a really interesting word. In the Greek, the original language, that word is mino. Everybody say mino. There, yeah, you can learn Greek today. You're a Greek scholar, more so than some of those people on my shelf. But uh, that is the Greek word here. It means to remain in the same place. And in this context, to remain in the same place under the same influence. So he says, abide in my word. Mino in my Word. Remain under the influence 
of my word. Then you are my disciples. Verse 32. You do that, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So it is only through his word, remaining under the influence of his word, that we can understand the truth. And only by understanding the truth, then, can we embrace freedom. Freedom comes from the truth. The truth comes from remaining under the influence of the word. Now, this seems like a simple statement. You know, we've heard this before, some of us. Uh, Abide in my word. Uh, The truth will set you free. Surely we've heard this. You know, people have this all over Pinterest and, and the little, you know, beautiful sunrise with the words on top of it on Facebook, uh, the truth will set you free. They quote it in very unbiblical movies, the truth will set you free. But the people hearing Jesus understood this in a different way, a little bit. You see, he's talking about freedom here, the truth will set you free. And their mind would immediately go to a place of, well, we are already free. You see, for them, in in the culture they lived in, they would say, The opposite of freedom is slavery. And so if Jesus is saying you're not free yet, but you will be if you uh, live in my word, if you remain under the influence of my word, so you're not free now, they're saying then we must be slaves to something. And they're saying we're not slaves, we're already free. Because slaves were prevalent in their culture as well as throughout their history in Israel. And so they answer him, verse 33, we are offspring of Abraham, We have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now remember, he's talking to the believers. The believers are the ones, they're struggling to understand this. And they're beginning to get a little irritated. You're going to see it in a second in in, in what they say. We're offspring of Abraham, and, and we've never been slaves in our entire lives. How is it that you say we will become free? We're already free now. And Jesus answers them. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So he tries to explain his scenario to people who have difficult understanding in the first place. What what he's talking about, he says, freedom doesn't come from all those things you may think freedom comes from in your life or how you feel freedom in your life. He says, if you simply practice any kind of sin, then you're a slave to it. That's where you're a slave. He's not saying you're a physical slave, like in history the Israelites were to the nation of Egypt. He's not saying that. He's saying you're a slave to sin. If you do it, it it, it, it has bound you up. It is leading you in the path of slavery. And he says, I can free you from that slavery. The Son can set you free, and you'll be free indeed, and you won't be bound anymore to anything. In today's world, we find freedom in all kinds of ways. Really, we find freedom in in what makes us happy and what makes us feel secure. We find freedom in financial security. But freedom doesn't come from financial security. Freedom doesn't come from an empty nest. Freedom doesn't come from mobility, being able to drive. You can't wait to get the keys from your parents. Freedom doesn't come from that. Freedom doesn't come from mobility, from, from, from getting that, or even in some day in the future, maybe your kids take your keys away. Freedom doesn't come from your keys. Freedom doesn't come from independence. Freedom doesn't come from control. Freedom doesn't come from authority. Freedom, freedom doesn't come from anticipating the next season of life. That doesn't bring freedom. Because what Jesus is talking about, he's talking about freedom from anxiety, freedom from confusion, freedom from anger, Freedom from bitterness. Freedom from trying to make other people happy with your life decisions. Freedom in this life from foolishness, from selfishness. Freedom only comes from Jesus' explanation, living in the Word. Remaining under the influence of the Word. And, and, but you understand this. Living in the Word, remaining in the Word, it produces within you spiritual superpowers. Spiritual superpowers. Imagine for a second all of the things that the the Word of God can free you from. All those things I listed there. Anxiety, fear, uh, discouragement, um, um, anger, bitterness. Imagine living the rest of your life never having one of those things touch you again. My word, 
I would give every ounce, every dollar I earn from now until the day I die to never have to experience that, never have my wife experience that, never have my kids experience that. But it begins with the Word, with the Word, with an investment in His Word, remaining under its influence, not ingesting it, letting it flow out, and never touching on it again, simply uh, allowing common sense or, or American culture common sense to guide the rest of my life instead of allowing Scripture. Then, if that's the case, if I don't rely on Scripture but rely on, on all of those um, uh, common sense statements that, that make up about all these different things and uh, uh, different ways and what may rationally make the most sense as far as uh, the, the, the retirement fund and how to raise my kids. And I read this book and that book and this book about how to raise kids. But if my kids, if I'm not grounding my kids in the Word of God, then it doesn't mean jack. Then they're not going to have any of this freedom. I can show them how to mow the yard. I can show them how to make a balance sheet. I can show them how to run a budget. I can show them how to change the oil, how to change a tire. But if they don't got the word of God, it means nothing. Nothing whatsoever. Living in the word, remaining under the influence of the word, produces spiritual superpowers. And it cannot be compared to anything else in this life. Joy that can never be taken away because of the headline that will be on the top of your feed tomorrow comes from the Word, because the Word never passes away. Jesus continues to talk to these people, and he says what, I mean, a, he says a lot in this passage, but this is one of the most convicting things to me. Verse 37, he says, I know you guys are the offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. They have no place for his word. They have no room for Jesus' word, for God's word. We have, I have made my life into occupied territory at times with not enough room for the room God deserves in my life. I have filled it up with a bunch of stuff and, and piled on. I, I, I tend to look at my life in terms of essentials that I've got to have in my life, and I've got to have those things. And as more quote-unquote essentials come, I just pile them up onto the essentials that are already there where my life schedule, mindset, uh, uh, financial responsibilities are this, m this massive thing of what I call essentials in my life, and I can't bear the weight. That's where breakdowns come from. That's where massive levels of anxiety come from because we have all of this stuff piled up and piled up and we haven't made room for God. We'll say, I've got all this that, that are essentials that I've got to have and then here's God. I'll just put God right there on top. He's going to balance him. Okay, it's good. And I'll give him whatever's left over there and we don't have room for God. A perfect illustration of this is our finances. Stop talking about money, preacher. But we'll go there for a minute. We'll say, I've got to pay the rent. I've got to pay the mortgage. I've got to pay the car. I've got to pay for gas in the car. We've got to pay for groceries. I mean, we've got four kids. We're about to have five, and they all eat way more than I eat. And how are we going to feed all these people? And we've got to feed this and do this. And we've got to have food for the dog. And we've got to have gas for the mower. And we've got to have a mower. And we've got to uh, report, uh, repair the house. The washer broke. And the, 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 we've got to have insulation in the attic. And we've got to do this and that and the other thing. Oh, I've got to pay for the cable bill to keep the kids entertained so the house doesn't come crumbling down. I've got to have a cell phone. I've got to have a plan for the cell phone and we have all these essentials and we're like, oh, oh yeah, I gotta give money to God. Uh, I got a quarter. Put that on top. And we think about the essentials before we think about God. I'll just give him a little bit left over. <laughs> That's upside down logic when it comes to how God provides for us financially. Let's just talk that for a second. We're gonna, I came across this term a few years ago. It's a very interesting thing. It's called zero-based budgeting. At the, in the, massive companies do this. Big 
you know, huge companies that you would know the name of. That's what some of these articles were based off of. At the end of every fiscal year, they wipe the budget clean. Don't say, this is what we did last year, so we're just going to think about what we're going to do next year based on what we did last year. They, they make every department come to them and say how much money they need and prove a reason they should have that much money. They start from zero and build up from there. They don't say, this is how much we have. We're only going to give a piece here and a piece there. They start from zero and build up. And once they get to the max, we don't have any more money, so you, you don't get any. They start from zero. Imagine if we did life-based zero budgeting with our lives. And we started from zero. And we inserted God first in our finances. Say, okay, I'm going to give money to the church. I'm going to tithe. Here's 10%. I'm going to give a little more. I've got a little more faith this year than I did last year. I'm going to give a little more. I'm going to give that to the church. I'm going to do it with my schedule. I'm going to give a little bit to God first. And we start building up. Okay, I gave to God. Now uh, we've got to have a place to live. We've got to give mortgage or rent. I've got to uh, have a vehicle to get to work so I can pay for stuff. I've got to have gas for that. I've got to have this. got to have that. And we get to the top. We say, well, I don't have money for uh, uh, Netflix. Well, Netflix is not an essential. What? kidding me? Let's get, what if cable's not an essential? Oh, now you're getting, mm, no, sir, uh-uh. Football season's starting. We need that. That is essential. I got to watch the Cowboys because they are God's team. Anyway, um, amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That's what I'm talking about. Mm, that's right. Got way off on that one. <laughs> I think, I think sometimes the Cowboys endure God's wrath more than anything else. And so we start piling up and piling up. And, 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 but if we started with God, what, what he promised is if you start with him, he'll provide for everything else. If you end with him, you'll never have enough, ever, ever. You can try it. I guarantee you, you try for one month, start with everything else and end with God, you're not going to have enough to pay for everything else. But if you start, let's say you start September in a couple of weeks, you start with God, you will have enough for everything else. He promises it in multiple places throughout Scripture. Let me get you a couple, little, a couple places. Matthew chapter 6, Malachi chapter 3, both places, Old Testament and New, he promises that he will provide for your needs if you put him first. Guaranteed. Try it and see what happens. But if we did that with the rest of our lives, imagine we would stop saying things like, I just don't have enough time in the day. But imagine if you put God first and you digested what was there, how would that change everything else? Zero-based life budgeting would change our entire perspective. Start from zero, add the true essentials back, and then begin to make room for the one who made the room. Us, our lives. Make room for him. I mean, how convicting is this? He's telling these people, you, my word finds no place in you. You don't have room enough in your life for my words. Man, what if he said that to me? I mean, and that, that is some days. I don't make room for his word. But if we started with it, it would change everything. And so Jesus tells them, my word finds no place in you. Verse 38. I speak of what I have seen with my father. You do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were really Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. Now, before, just understand a little context. They raised in the Jewish culture, they would understand what Scripture says about Abraham. It says that Abraham was counted righteous because of his belief. Abraham was counted righteous because of what he believed, not of what he did. He had faith, and so God declared him righteous. And so Jesus is reminding them of this fact. They're saying we're children of Abraham, not children of some other random father. He says, if you were really Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did, having faith. Verse 40. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. That is not what Abraham did. He, he inserts this paradigm-breaking if in verse 39. If you were Abraham's children. They were relying on their entrance into heaven based on the fact that they were physical descendants of Abraham. And Jesus is introducing an idea that was brought up 
in the Old Testament scripture, when God called Abraham, Jesus is reminding them, and Paul picks it up again in the book of Romans. He says, Abraham, his, his descendants are not based upon lineage. Abraham's descendants are based upon a faith heritage. He says, your father isn't Abraham, but somebody else. And he's, he's going to explain that. Verse 41. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we are not born out of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Now, it seems like they took a wide left turn there on what they're saying. But again, cultural context here. Uh, they're getting offended now. They're getting angry. They're, they're, Jesus is explaining a truth to them, a hard truth, but they're not buying it. They are getting angry at him. He says, you do the works your father did, which are unfaithful works. And this is an Old Testament concept that they would understand, that um, it's an illustration from Old Testament prophecy that is used repeatedly. He's referring to being unfaithful in faith. Not unfaithful in marriage, but unfaithful in faith. God repeatedly throughout the Old Testament referred to his relationship with Israel as a marriage, as a union. And whenever they would go off and, and worship other gods or pursue other priorities than God, he would say they were being immoral. They were uh, being unfaithful in that relationship. And so when they say uh, we are not children of sexual immorality, that's what they're talking about here. They're not talking about physical, they're talking spiritual. They're saying we have one father, even God. And then God, Jesus takes this next section, this last section we're going to look at, and he explains a very hard truth to them. But he does it with a kind, redemptive heart because he wants them to be redeemed. He wants them to turn to the Lord. Verse 42, if God really were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Is it because you cannot bear? Or he says, it is because you cannot bear to hear my word. Now, remember he had said just a moment ago that they didn't have any room for his word in their lives. And because they have not made room in, his, in, in, in their lives for his word, they can't hear it. They're not able to hear it. They can't hear Jesus because they're listening to someone else. Verse 44, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar, the father of lies. So he says, you're listening to your father. You're listening to the devil. You're listening to the father of lies. Not paying attention to where you need to be paying attention to. You can't hear my words because you're listening to somebody else. You're following that somebody else and not paying attention to what you need to be paying attention to, the thing that matters the most. Paying attention, that reminded me the other day of a time uh, in, when I was in college. Um, I would go over to my grandparents' house and do my laundry. Uh, well, until my grandmother got sick, she did my laundry. <laughs> so that's why I went. And um, it was free, didn't have to pay to do laundry like you would in the dorms. And I'd go over there and do laundry, and then in the afternoons on Saturdays, uh, we would eat pizza, and uh, we'd watch, my granddad went to Texas A&M, and we'd watch the Aggies play, or listen to them if they weren't on TV. Die hard Aggies fan, die hard Cowboy fan. If the Aggies had a bad day, everyone in the house had a bad day, <laughs> okay? I know some of you can relate to the hogs, but let's just go with my story. Uh, and so... I would do laundry, and uh, we'd eat pizza and uh, watch football. At night, we'd watch the Gaither Hour. And uh, on Sundays, I'd go back. I'd go to church with them. And uh, my granddad would pick up Luby's on the way to the house for lunch. We'd go have lunch at their house and watch the Cowboys. Well, there was one day we were watching the Cowboys, and my granddad, are in, we're into it. Uh, I mean, we're, we're into it. And we're, we're talking to the TV and talking to the refs and talking to the players and we're going at it, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, both of us, some of you may have heard this story, and if you have, I've only got one life and only so many stories, so just go, just act like you have it. And all of a sudden, we're watching the Cowboys, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, both of us get slapped on the shoulder, hard. What in the world? My grandmother's sitting between us. What is going on? We're eating our lubies, watching the Cowboys. 
She says, I've been choking for five minutes and neither one of you morons did anything about it. Oh, I knew you had it. I, you took a drink of water. I knew everything was okay. She says, I could have died. I'm a, she, she was a doctor. I'm a doctor and know about these things. I could have died and y'all still would have been screaming at Dion on the TV. Sorry. <laughs> and we had been paying attention to one thing that was across the room and not paying attention to the thing that was right next to us that mattered the most. We were so consumed with this other thing and missed the most important thing. How often do we do that, right? We pay attention to stuff that really doesn't matter. Were the Cowboys going to lose? Yeah, probably. We could have guessed that before the game started. But my grandmother was sitting there, and we could have been paying attention to her and not gotten slapped. And it would have been a, 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 a far kinder lunch. We were focused on what we should not have been focused on, paying attention to what we should not have been paying attention to or as much attention as we were giving it. We need to listen to our true Father, the Lord, and not the other Father. You know, who you hear determines your future. Who you hear determines your future. Who you, the voices you allow to influence you, remember we're supposed to be abiding in the Word, remaining under the influence of the Word. Who we allow to influence us determines our future path. The decisions we make today determines our tomorrow. Who you hear determines your future. You can be laying in bed in the morning and you hear a voice in your head when your alarm goes off, just five more minutes. And then you wake up an hour later and the voice you heard determined your future. Tonight, late at night, you can hear a voice in your head that says, just one more piece of cake. And that will determine how you feel an hour later or the number on the scale tomorrow. Who you hear determines your future. Or you can wake up on a Sunday morning. The forecast may have rain. Your kids may be going nuts. You may have had a really rough week. And you hear a voice saying, you don't have to go to church this Sunday. Just take one off. It's no big deal. But who you hear determines your future, physically, emotionally, spiritually. Jesus is trying to communicate to these people, listen to the Father, listen to me, the one the Father has sent, and watch what will happen in your life. Let's finish it, verse 45. Because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And it may seem really harsh in the moment that Jesus is really diving into these people, but he's trying to get them to understand they have a need for redemption. They have a need for a Savior. He cares about their future, so he wants them to turn to the Lord. And he delivers this, this difficult truth, this possibly offensive truth, but always with a heart of redemption in it. Sometimes, you know, we talked last week about being, having, being full of grace in how we communicate to people because, you know, everyone's in need of grace. But sometimes we still have to deliver a difficult truth. Sometimes the truth can be offensive, but our delivery must be redemptive. The truth may be offensive, but our delivery must be redemptive. Sometimes even the reception, when somebody's telling us a difficult truth, how we receive that truth must also be redemptive. Our concern must always be about the redemption of others, about pointing others to the Lord, about expressing their need for the Lord. So whether we're receiving a difficult truth or delivering a difficult truth, we must be redemptive. And a lot of times the redemptive delivery comes down to our motivations. Now again, I can't read your minds I can only tell you what I go through sometimes. I sometimes have a truth that I want that I want to deliver to somebody. And there is more a desire to deliver the truth, quote unquote, than to see that person redeemed. There's more a feeling of wanting to be right in the situation 
or wanting that other person to see me as right or, or the final authority or, or in control than wanting to, them to be redeemed. I know none of you have ever had that with your spouse, right? Quiet room. You've never wanted to be right in those conversations or with your kids, get the final word out because I said so, and I'll Google the answer later. You never want to be proven right more than you care about the redemption of the other person's heart. Or when somebody at work challenges you on something and it's that really irritating person and you're really frustrated with them and you just want to slap them down and so you use your words and you beat them down and in the moment though you're not really caring about the heart of the other person. Jesus is expressing an extremely difficult truth for the people to hear. But he's doing it because he wants them to come to the Lord. How often in our conversations are, are we genuinely concerned about the redemption of the other person's heart in what we communicate to them? Even if what we're communicating is a difficult truth, we should still deliver it even as Jesus has here for the purpose of the redemption of the other people. Because remember the thing I said at the beginning, there is no exemption from a need for redemption. And so when I have to search my own motives in, in why I want to deliver a quote-unquote truth to somebody, I need to be redeemed in my, of myself and say, I have to go back to the Lord and say, maybe what I want to say isn't what I need to say. If I'm really concerned about the heart of the other person being pointed to the Lord, then what comes out of my mouth does not need to be that thing that I was about to say. Because the weight of my words in that moment will have dramatic effect and potentially change the rest of our relationship for all time. I need to be concerned about the redemption of that person more than I care about being right or being proven in control or being proven like I know everything or being proven like I want to build up my own self and ego. Because what matters in eternity is the redemption of all of our souls and our hearts. And today, maybe you need to find that for the first time. Jesus, the Son of God, died so that you could be redeemed. And he cared enough for the world that he came and he died as the Son of God so all your sins would be forgiven. And then he rose from the dead so that you can live after you die. And that's what it's all about. That's what matters. It doesn't matter who has control of Congress, who sits in the White House. It doesn't matter what TV shows are going to premiere this fall. It doesn't matter how good your kid does on that sports team. It doesn't matter if you get the promotion or you hit your 401k goals. Eternally, it doesn't. What matters is that you know Jesus and you point as many people to him as possible. Because in a hundred years, we're all going to be gone. And what's going to matter then is all about who you know. So today, do you know Jesus? And if you don't, come and talk to me. Talk to Micah. We'll fix it today. You can know him right now. Before you walk off this green carpet, you can know him today. Or if you do know Jesus and you need to work on the redemptive nature of your conversational tones Pray about that today. Pray about maybe the, the conversations that are, take place in your own household, in your family, in your workplace, with your friends. Are they all redemptive in nature? And if not, how can you be used by God to be the change agent in those moments?